All right, we're going to get started just a couple minutes after two. So I got some folks coming in. Wow, 15 people for an afternoon program. I'm impressed. Thank you for making James work for the money today. Again, put more chairs out. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm Jess Scott, the director of the Historical Society. If we haven't met or if you're a member, I certainly appreciate you coming out today. Um, we are so very excited for this program and the subject matter, of course, for the interference. Um, just wanted to reiterate, um, this is the first of um, two members-only programs that we have going on. Uh, the other is this coming Sunday at the Cox House, and that is for those with Santa. And uh, you'll be able to come, and uh, it'll be inside. We have said it's going to be outside. It's really cold. It's going to be inside. Um, you get 10 minutes with Santa to take photos um, and kind of look around a little. We'll have some treats for folks, but it's members only, uh, and uh, we're pretty excited for that. So that's coming up. And then we, of course, have uh, our regular program. We've got a couple of those yet coming up. Uh, film series is on the 1st of December, and then Christmas at the Cox House is December 16th through the 18th. Uh, a couple of other real quick housekeeping things. If you're new to the building or haven't been here in a while, restrooms are at the other end of the lobby. If you haven't yet, if you could silence or turn off your cell phones so we don't have any interruptions. Uh, and then I am making more coffee for those of you who need it. <laughs> and the refreshments, of course, are in the back of the room. You can get a chance for those. Um, so without further ado, um, we are going to introduce Karen and I said Humphrey. Karen grew up in the North London, New Sweden area where she discovered her love of history at age eight when both communities and Minnesota celebrated centennials. She is a past president of the Minnesota Historical Society and the Norwegian American Historical Society. She currently serves on boards of the Swedish American Historical Society and the National Lutheran Choir. She is an author and an independent scholar, um, and the Swedish American Historical Quarterly has published three of her articles. Her article that we're going to learn about today on Sam Hogdell and the New Sweden Creamery was published in the fall 2021 Minnesota History Magazine. Karen recently retired from the Minnesota Historical Society and is currently a consultant to the Norwegian American Historical Association. Help me welcome Karen. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Jessica. Thank you. <clears throat> this is really exciting to see so many people here. I am astounded. But I know that my extended family that's here, friends and relatives from the North London, New Sweden area, love history as much as I do. And I think it's evident uh, for those of you that um, aren't familiar with, Nor are so familiar with North London, New Sweden, that marvelous book that was published in honor of the 150th anniversary of the community. That has made such a difference for all of us to, re to remember, to use as a reference, and to look up things that we, you know, well, let's check the North London, New Sweden history, or as some people call it, with a small b, the Bible. And there's so much great information there. And it's because people love history. And people like Garfield Eckberg, who spearheaded that drive, made it possible, as did everyone that put together uh, their family stories and, uh, um, and, and made that book possible. There are people here, I should just mention, that have known me since before I was born, actually. And there are people here who I went to country school with and Sunday school with and um, it just dear, dear friends and relatives. Thank you so much for coming and your support for Minnesota and Nicollet County history. It's really, really important. And the older we get, we understand that there are more and more people who we cannot go to to ask the questions we've always wanted to know about. So we have to hold up each other and remember that it's our turn now to uh, sort of be the elders of a community with great history. One of the most interesting stories about Nicollet County itself, I think, is the story of Sam Hogdahl, the butter maker that, at the New Sweden Creamery and the immigrant farm families that in the last decade of the 19th century elevated the quality of their product and established Nicollet County and indeed Minnesota 
as one of the nation's premier agricultural leaders. Sam Hogdahl and the patrons of the New Sweden Creamery helped cement Minnesota's credibility. Since this article was published in the October 2021 uh, Minnesota History Magazine, I have received emails from all over, people remembering the creameries that dotted rural areas until the mid 20th century. And there were people asking, the editor himself, Josh Leventhal, where did you find that story? And Paris? And Grand Champion Butter? New Sweden? Where in the world is that? And what street is that creamery on? And so, <clears throat> one must take time to explain New Sweden and Norseland. And in this day and age, with fewer and fewer people uh, familiar with rural communities, it takes a while to help people understand. The story of Sam Hogdahl and the New Sweden Creamery is a story that we grew up with. But my curiosity was always, how did this happen? Who was Sam Hogdahl? And who were the patrons that had such cream? And did Sam bring the butter to Paris himself? I began some years ago now by emailing Bob Sandine here at the Nicollet County Historical Society with an inquiry about what information there might be on hand about the New Sweden Creamery, especially before 1905. And there, was there any, any information about Sam Hogdahl himself? Bob emailed back with the very important news that there were the stock certificates from the beginning and even more important the secretary's books dating back to the founding of the creamery so i made an appointment with bob and with ruth Eckstein, who had the boxes out containing the secretary's books and you can only imagine my joy when i discovered the minutes were written in english <laughs> by and they were in beautiful penmanship by uh, Creamery Board Secretary A. P. Anderson. And so the research began. I was still working at the Minnesota Historical Society at the time, and during my noon hours and Saturday mornings, I researched the archives at MNHS and additional research at the Norwegian American Historical Association, the archive um, in the Rollbog Library at St. Olaf College, and online documents of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And for this local history story, Gresham's history of Nicollet and Lesueur counties, family histories that people have shared with me over many, many years now that are in my own library, and books by author historian and pastor Dr. Emory Johnson and Pastor Craig Firkenstead at the Norwegian Church. I must also give great thanks to Scott Hermanson, Garfield Ekberg, Harold Rodning, Willis Anthony, Marlon Peterson, and the late and greatly missed Julian Olson, who shared photos, insight, and perspective on this story. This story, then, is about a butter maker, an immigrant from Norway, and the art of his butter making that won the grand prize at the World's Fair in that storied time in Paris in 1900. It's an almost unthinkable achievement. This story is also about farm families, all of them immigrants themselves, that provided the, butter, the product to the New Sweden Creamery where the butter maker plied his art and how this achievement became one of the stepping stones to Minnesota's and the Midwest place in the agriculture in the world today. So many of you are familiar with this plat map of New Sweden Township 1899, just one year before the World's Fair in Paris. Norwegians from Toten, Hollingdahl and Gudbrandsdahl immigrated to this place about 1854. And Swedish immigrants from Småland and Skåne came here in 1857. 168 years later, here's a sense of what the land looks like. This photo was taken May 30th, uh, 2021, looking out from the cemetery at Scanyon Grove Lutheran Church, which is just across the New Sweden Lake Prairie Township line. This is original Dakota homeland. And this is where the Norwegians and Swedes built their homes. They found flat topography reaching to the horizon and beneath the tall prairie grass, rich, deep, dark soil, some of the richest on the planet. 
Per Magnus Tegner came to New Sweden in 1869 from Tofte Tegneby in Småland, Sweden, and here's what he had to say when he described his new home and the new landscape in a letter to his family shortly after he arrived. He wrote this home to Sweden. Yesterday, <clears throat> I went to see the land that Sven Ekberg is to have. It looked good. There was grass so high, it came up to our knees, and in some places it was even longer. Everyone in Sweden thinks we're not telling the truth, but we are. Everything that is written about the country looks good, no matter where you go. One year later, he sent another letter home, described the winter of 1870. <clears throat> I want to say that the winter here has been very harsh. Three feet of snow on the average. Some days it's so cold one cannot go to the barn, and the weather is blowing snow so that one cannot see the barn. A few days ago, someone's wife got lost between the house and the barn and froze to death. Back to the plat map. I want to focus on this particular section of New Sweden Township and some of the people that settled here and nurtured families who established farms and organized churches and a cooperative creamery. You'll notice such names as Haugen, Kopeng, Anderson, Bjorkland, Tanquist, Peterson, Ekberg, Webster, changed from Westerberg, Swenson. Beyond the circle are Petersons, Olsons, Hermanson, Pearsons, Nelsons, Larsons, Tustensons, Solmanson, Hogstrom, Lagerstrom, Ostrom, and Strand. So we know where these people came from. <laughs> this plat map is just across the county line, or the township line in Lake Prairie Township at Norseland, and here is where the immigrants built their churches. The Norwegian church, founded on June 6, 1858, and the Swedish church, known as Scandian Grove, was founded on June 13, 1858. There's also a District 4 school there, a cooperative creamery founded just a couple years after the uh, New Sweden Creamery, and of course the greatly missed Norseland General Store. We all know that Norseland and New Sweden have been inextricably linked since the beginning. It's a wonderful example of Norwegians and Swedes in both communities farming side by side, working together for a better community for all. They were separate on Sunday mornings, but together for all the other important times in their lives. So one of the things you have to explain to others is that the nearest towns of any size, St. Peter, Nicollet, and Gaylord, are each about 12 miles in different directions. Here at Norseland and New Sweden, there are homes and fields, steeples, silos, grain bins, tree lines, and farm families that produce an abundance of food to feed the rest of us. I want to point out just a few of the families that settled in the communities. One of the leaders of the community was Sven Swenson, Jr., who you'll see on the far left. His wife, Christy Knud's daughter, Beckestad, is seated in the middle. Swenson was born in Hull, Hallingdal, Norway, and came to New Sweden with his parents in 1857. A year later, he and his parents and his siblings were at the organizational meeting of the Norwegian church. And from 1886 to 1888, he served in the Minnesota legislature. Swenson was also the first choir director of the church. Christy was born in Ål, Hallingdal, and came to New Sweden in 1859. They were married in 1860 and began farming. I must point out a, a couple of the people in this photo. Standing in the center back with the uh, Teddy Roosevelt mutton chops is Swen and Christy's son, Lawrence, who served as US Minister to Denmark, 19, 1897 to 1905, Ambassador to Norway, 1911 to 1913, and ended his career as a, a diplomat, as ambassador to the Netherlands in 1934. Lawrence married Ingeborg Odegaard, daughter of Johannes Johansson uh, and Martha Odegaard, on whose farm the Norwegian church was organized. And the reason I use the Norwegian American Historical Association archives is because Lawrence Swenson's papers are there and I wanted to find out what the correspondence might have been with Lawrence and his father during the time of the founding of the creamery. I didn't find any, they didn't mention that correspondence. There's a little correspondence there, but, uh, but not enough. But I thought, I'm gonna check those papers and, and uh, someone help me. But it, you have to check lots of things when you're doing research. 
Standing behind Christie is Julianne, who married a neighboring farmer, Carl Severine Olson, who was born in Lillehammer. They too established a dairy farm, and she would, be would become the maternal aunt of Theodore Blagan, the great historian of the Norwegian migration and Minnesota history and Midwest history. And standing behind Swen is their son Oscar, who served in the state legislature from 1931 to 1950. He was elected Speaker of the House in 1931, and all during the years in the legislature, he and his brothers continued the Swenson family dairy. This wonderful wedding photo is of Charles Schostrom and his bride, Julia Eckberg, the second child and first daughter of Charles, an immigrant from Smoland, and Mary Webster Eckberg, uh, also from Smoland. I show this wedding portrait uh, because, as is custom in Scandinavian communities, the daughters were charged with caring for the dairy, milking cows, and of course milking them by hand. Garfield told me the story handed down in his family that when Julia and Charles were married on the Eckberg farm in August 1900, her parents gave them a cow as a wedding present. It was likely a milking shorthorn, which was typical at that time, and it, this cow was a prized possession. Charles, however, was heard to say that with Julia's marriage, he lost his best milker. <laughs> And this photo of Ingrid Swenson Webster, surrounded by her family on her 80th birthday in 1910. Ingrid and her husband Andrew, who died in 1886, came to Minnesota in 1857, and they were among the founders of Scandian Grove. I look at this photo, and many of us have similar photos of big family gatherings, and I think of all that these people live through at this point, 1910, to make homes, communities, lives, and now they're surrounded by generations on this new land. You, we all have photos, and it's such a treasure. Just look at them and help and remind, remind yourself of what they did so that we have our lives today. These people are but an example of Minnesota families who live their lives in rural communities as our state was developing. Members of this family and their neighbors endured the U.S.-Dakota War of 1862, many of them taking refuge at a sod fort uh, constructed at Scanyon Grove or came to St. Peter for refuge. Maria Johnson and her young son, Per, were killed in ambush near New Sweden on August 23, 1862. And Ingrid herself, that woman now seated in the middle, was just 32 years old with four young children. Andrew at that time was, and several other immigrant settlers were called to form a Scandinavian guard. Some of the immigrants uh, fought in the Civil War. One of them was Andrew Quist, who was severely wounded at that turning point battle of Gettysburg, and he was left for dead. But somehow he came back to New Sweden Township. Mid 19th century agriculture in Minnesota was dominated by wheat. Red Wing in southeastern Minnesota in 1873 was the largest primary wheat market in the world with a warehouse that could hold more than a million bushels of grain. But such a monoculture exhausted soil quality and was susceptible to the vagaries of weather and insect infestations such as the devastating grasshopper plague in Nicollet County 1873 to 1877. Ingrid's husband, Andrew, made headlines in newspapers across the state that summer of 1875 when he used two teams of horses running with tarred scoops 15 feet wide. He caught 633 bushels of grasshoppers in one day. So, farm families were looking for ways to diversify, and Swen Swenson, among others, became interested in dairying as a possibility. In 1885, Swenson traveled to Decorah, Iowa, where he purchased a registered Holstein bull from Cyrus Aiken, and again, two Holstein heifers in 1887, thereby establishing an outstanding herd of dairy cattle. This man, Theophilus Levi Hacker, shown here at his desk at the University of Minnesota, had the biggest impact on the dairy industry statewide. He was recruited from Wisconsin by the regents of the University of Minnesota 
and he began his quarter century professorship here uh, by traveling by passenger and freight train, horse and buggy, to visit farmers and creameries throughout the state as he investigated the dairy industry. At the Danish settlement of Clark's Grove in Freeborn County, he found the model for cooperative dairying based on the principle, one man, one vote, and the return of all um, profits to patrons in proportion to the amount of produce each supplied. Dr. Hacker wrote bulletins, held short courses, and lectured throughout the state on this cooperative idea. Dr. Hacker, Hacker's pa papers at the Minnesota Historical Society show that Sven Swenson was, attended one of those short courses, as did Theodore Nelson from Norseland. And this idea, this Danish idea of cooperatives, resonated with this body of Scandinavian farmers at New Sweden. The New Sweden Cooperative Creamery was founded in 1895 with Sven Swenson as president and elected a board of trustees there with names of Olson, Peterson, Hermanson, Anderson, Tegner, Quist, and Bjorkland. Here's Alfred Bjorkland's certificate, stock certificate signed by Swenson and A.P. Anderson, secretary of the organization. And those stock certificates are here at the Nicollet County Historical Society. The first creamery was built and ready for business on May 28, 1895. The first butter maker was M.M. Jermstad, also a Norwegian. The second butter maker was Sam Hogdahl. Sam Hogdahl was born August 18, 1866 at Sparbu, Trundelag. In Norway, Hogdahl studied the art and the science of butter and cheese making at Verdalens Meiri, one of the centers for Norwegian's important, Norway's important dairy industry. Butter was an important trading commodity in Norway. Nearly all the surplus butter was shipped to Denmark, where the art of butter making created such quality that it demanded and received the highest price on the British market, the butter market of the world at that time. Hogdahl took further training at Setter, an agricultural school in Trundelag that was modeled on the Danish folk high schools developed by that theologian NFS Grundtvig. In 1887, Hogdahl was appointed the first manager of the new Snosa Meiri, a cooperative creamery established by local farmers. Sam married Anna Vasket, daughter of Christopher and Shersti Vasket at Snosa in 1888. She also from a farm family. Somehow he learned that buttermakers could make more money in America, and so in the spring of 1891, the couple arrived in Minnesota. Within two weeks, he was hired at Hitterdahl and then served creameries in Wadena, Starbuck, and Sedan up in northwestern Minnesota. <clears throat> he would later comment that the product was not as satisfactory as he would have liked. In 1898, he was hired at New Sweden and moved his family. So here you see Sigvald, who was born in Norway, Sophia, and Abner. They moved into the buttermaker's house on the creamery property. So Sam must have liked and thought that the product that these Norwegian and Swedish immigrant farmers brought to the creamery. And he began entering competitions. The butter was judged on standards of flavor, grain, color, salting. And the new Sweden butter earned 98 out of 100 points in competitions in Topeka, Omaha, the Minnesota State Fair, among others. Here he's wearing several of his medals, and we thought maybe one of those was the medal he won in Paris, but it was not. He never went to Paris with butter. More on that in a bit. Now, the Paris Exposition of 1900 was on the horizon, and President William McKinley, Secretary of Agriculture, James Wilson, asked state dairy associations for assistance to nominate farms and factories that could submit entries to represent U.S. agriculture at this great event in Paris. Hogdahl, of course, was a leading co candidate and accepted the challenge and the invitation, as did five other butter makers in Minnesota and representatives from 16 other states. Now just how was this butter going to be shipped to Paris in the spring of 1900? Secretary Wilson appointed this man to be in charge, Major Henry Alvord, 
a graduate of West Point and a veteran of the Civil War. And Major Alvord put together a plan to try to assure success. So here's the new Sweden Creamery in 1900. Note the women standing on the buckboard uh, bringing their cream from their farm. Thanks to Marlon Peterson, by the way, for this photo. From New Sweden, two firkins of butter were transported by horse and buggy from New Sweden to St. Peter. Then they were shipped by rail to St. Paul, then from St. Paul to New York, where it was packed in watertight chests filled at the last possible hour, and then transferred to the cold room on the American steamship to Southampton, England. Then it was transferred uh, on, uh, to steamboat to the port of Havre. And then it was transferred to a train that lacked refrigeration, but made an overnight run to Paris. And when the chests were open, after 12 days of travel, the ice was found to be mostly unmelted, and the product survived. And so, the new Sweden butter was put on display here in the dairy pavilion in the U.S. agriculture display for June and July 1900 at this, at, uh, in this pavilion. Now, the World's Fair in Paris was a feast for the imagination at the turn of the last century. There were moving sidewalks for the first time, talking pictures, diesel engines, a giant Ferris wheel, 5,000 incandescent light bulbs. There was a century of achievement by French artists, the famous impressionists of Pissarro. This painting is by Pissarro, note the haystack. Matisse, Cezanne, Gauguin, Degas, and Monet. And here's Monet's haystacks. He did 25 of this series. This one is at the Orangerie in Paris. There's another one, you know, at the Minneapolis Institute of Arts. And the butter competition was fierce. A jury of international experts spent several days deliberating on butter, submitted by these, these countries, Denmark, France, Sweden, Holland, Belgium, Norway, Great Britain, all great. They had the chefs, they had the, you know, they had all of that quality. And New Sweden, representing the United States, all the deliberations were conducted in French. In the meantime, and I'd like to thank Scott Hermanson for this photo. In the meantime, back in New Sweden, Anne and Sam Hogdahl had organized the first creamery picnic held on June 19th to celebrate the Cooperative Creamery's five-year anniversary. Now, I want to say this is not as much as we wanted it to be, Scott and I and Garfield. This is not that picture from that first, uh, from that first picnic. It's from another one. But it's just to give you an idea of the people that are there. Many of you may recognize people in this photo. Sam Hogdahl, I'm sorry, um, uh, Swen Swenson is sitting in the middle with a cane. Do you see that? And other people we can identify as well. And if you have any, you'd like to look at this later and see whom you might know, that would be terrific. So the St. Peter Journal was there, and they reported 500 to 700 people came for the event. Imagine this picture now as the St. Peter Journal describes it. Flags flew on the creamery and above the New Sweden General Store. The speaker's podium was decorated with boughs of summer leaves. Sven Swenson, the grand old man of the whole idea, presided. The crowd was entertained by the Norseland Nora Cornet Band, playing selections on their new silver-plated instruments, and the Norwegian Lutheran Church Choir sang. Professor Theophilus Hacker himself was there to compliment the shareholders. And also giving remarks was Senator John A. Johnson, who in five years would be elected Minnesota's governor. Creamery Board Secretary A.P. Anderson read the report, noting that 500,000 pounds of butter had been manufactured and sold for $93,098.93. When the reports and speeches and music were completed, a picnic was served. The newspaper reported long tables had been set with, beneath the leafy canopy and fairly groaned with many good things to eat. The repast had been prepared by the ladies and certainly evidenced the fact that there are no better cooks than the ladies of New Sweden. 
Two months later, Sam Hogdahl finally received word on the outcome of his entry in the Paris competition. In a letter dated Tuesday, August 28, 1900, the acting head of USDA's Dairy Division, dairy division <coughs> wrote Hogdahl and the results. The letter said, the creamery butter prepared by you has received the grand prize de honor. I certainly congratulate you on the highest honors. The award, the letter went on to say, was made solely on the merits of the article itself. Some members of the grand jury in Paris questioned the outcome. How could this be? The French were especially upset. World champion butter from a remote place, New Sweden? How could this be? A recount was demanded. But the judges sustained the honor, and there we are. The grand champion butter of the world, Sam Hogdahl, the New Sweden farmers, farm families, and the New Sweden Creamery, the grand prize of the world for butter. The announcement was carried in newspapers across the state and throughout the dairy industry. <coughs> Excuse me. Sam Hogdahl was in demand as a speaker, a judge, and a columnist throughout Minnesota and the country. So Sam resigned his position in New Sweden in 1902 with great thanks from the shareholders. <coughs> Excuse me. He and Anne moved to St. Peter, just 12 miles from their New Sweden neighbors and friends. And here they lived, I think this is the right house, uh, 720 North 5th here in St. Peter. The couple hosted many friends and community events, including a reception on their lawn for 100 butter makers in, 19, in July 1927. And the newspaper reported, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, the newspaper reported that Mrs. Hogdahl served a delightful luncheon of coffee, sandwiches, and cakes. Sam Hogdahl died here on April 19, 1943, at the age of 76. His wife, Anne, died in 1951 at the home of their daughter. <coughs> Excuse me. New Sweden butter was well known for decades, but economies of scale forced the closing of the creamery in 1972. As part of our nation's bicentennial, a marker was placed that you saw earlier as one of the historic places in Nicollet County. And the creamery behind it, which was built in 1925, was taken down several years ago. The bricks from the creamery have been saved and now mounted at the restored District 6 schoolhouse. So as of this time, there are two dairy farmers left in New Sweden and Norseland, and both are well known. The Sven Svensson farm now has the longest line of registered Holsteins in the United States, maybe even the world. The sign says 1885, as you can see. Heading that farming operation is Dr. Ashley Swenson, the great, great, great granddaughter of Swin and Sven and Christy. And here with her husband, Christopher Hansen, and her parents, Paul and Cindy. Milking is <coughs> done by robots. And here is the family of Rolf and Jean Anningstead with their, uh, when Emily was crowned Princess K of the Milky Way in 2017. That's her brother Matthias on the left and Leif on the right. All are University of Minnesota graduates with double majors in agriculture, animal science, animal nutrition, agribusiness, and communications. As of this writing, <coughs> Descendants of the founders of the New Sweden Cooperative Creamery, Swenson, Olson, Ekberg, Hermanson, Quist, Bjorkland, are still farming the original homesteads in, Norseland, in New Sweden Township and family farms at Norseland too. Although Sam Hogdahl's time with the New Sweden Creamery was relatively brief, his award-winning success as buttermaker for the cooperative Norwegian and Swedish immigrant farmers represents the impact of immigrant farming communities established during the first half century of Minnesota statehood. Since 1854, the farm communities at New Sweden and Norseland provide a model that helped to shape our rich rural heritage and establish the state 
as a global provider of food and fiber. And for this, we all give great thanks. I'm going to take a sip of water, and I want to close with something else. <coughs> Excuse me. Theodore Blagan, as I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> wrote this in an essay published by University of Minnesota Press in 1947. The words of Theodore Blagan. Gather up the diaries and other records that tell of the way of life of the farmer. And one day the historians may surprise us by writing the story of the farm and its people, not less fascinating and more significant to the people of today than the story of the medieval manor. It will be a story of development from the day of small things, a story of people who in their toil and their integrity create the great things that historians and poets and novelists search for in the human saga. Thanks to Theodore Blagan for rounding that up for us. I'd be happy to answer any questions if I can. Um, there's other people here that could answer a lot of questions, I'm sure. Any questions at all? <clears throat> yes? Do you know where Sam Hunter or where he may be buried at? <clears throat> he, I believe that he's buried in St. Peter at the cemetery across up by Gustavus. I was going to look this up myself, but, I, but there's also... Um, a marker that says Hogdall my, is my understanding in Masur. So we have to figure that out. But thank you for that question. Yes. He was my great grandfather. All right. Oh. Yay. Buried, uh, up from the old Hermes, that cemetery. There's a big uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. I knew that he, thank you. I knew that he had family here. And, you know, I just did this up till 1905. So I have a question for you. Do you have any more of his papers that belong here at the Nicollet County Historical Society or at the Minnesota Historical Society? Where, where I should mention, there is a collection at, at MNHS archives of his columns that he wrote for the San Francisco paper, the Yakima Washington Dairy uh, paper. So there, there's a body of his writing. And when I looked through it, they were not dated. So. But you know, if there's things that people have that they've gotten on eBay or whatever, they should be in the public, in a public, a place where the where people can research them. So I don't want to put you on the spot, but. All over the room. We also have the medals that were. Do you? We're uh, passing around. Okay. All right. And I certainly respect your, I certainly respect your, you know, the family having them. <clears throat> but when you don't know what to do with them yet. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, and your great-grandchildren, what, what is this about, you know? You, you know, they should be, I would encourage you to, to bring them here because, yeah, because it's such an important story. It's a great story. It really is something, don't you think? I mean, how did this happen? I just think it's wonderful. Thank you for introducing yourself and I look forward to hearing more. Yes. What was that large gathering you had mentioned where Governor uh, Johnson was? Yes, a governor, he wasn't governor yet. He was the state senator, John A. Johnson. So um, let me see if, what year was that? you know, is Scott here? No, okay, we tried to figure this out. Let me go back to that. It is such a great picture. He found it in his aunt, great aunt Sophie, wasn't it? <coughs> Sophie Hermanson's collection. The Hermansons, there's um, Don and Rhonda are there, and they, their family were early members. So, <clears throat> I was, you see those marks on the top there? I was so hoping that said 1900. Yeah. But on closer examination, it didn't. <laughs> and then I was so hoping that <clears throat> this person, could this be Sam Hogdahl himself? You know, young, he was only 32. So I tested this with people, I just showed him the picture, um, a picture and I showed them this one and they said five people said I don't think so no. so you know what can you say but you know here here is Sven Swenson I'm, and here is Carl Severine Olson 
And here's Martin Quist, yes. And I'm pretty sure that this is Charles Eckberg. And there are other people here that you would know. So I think Scott has been working on this because it's so, such a great photo. So we don't know the year, but in the newspaper, it was reported in that picnic was 1900. No, I have a photograph at home. I showed it to Bob Sandin already, but uh, Governor Johnson, there's a huge number of people in the photograph, and Governor John, well, Johnson is in the front row, but he may not have been governor yet. He yeah, it said he was senator yeah. in 1900. I've got a cabinet card photo. Okay. Let's check that out and see if it's anywhere near New Sweden. Yeah. That would be great. Um, so, any other questions? There's more questions. Yes? How many are here today that are related to Sam Hogdahl? How many are related to Sam Hogdahl? Look at that. Three people. Are you all great? How, how are you related? Gra grandsons? Well, this is the youngest of five. Okay. And this is my son, Frank. Wonderful. Are you grandsons, great grandsons? Yeah. Right. Grandsons, okay. Yeah. And yeah, you're the great, children. Great, 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 great. Okay, and you are the children of Sam Hogdahl, Sam Hogdahl Jr. Jr. Okay, yes, and he was not on that photo. He was born after. Yeah, yeah. he was born <laughs> after. That's right. There's so much that we need to know about that. Yeah. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Any any other questions that anyone has or comments? Willis. This is Willis Anthony. <laughs> into the Paris World Fair. Yeah. <laughs> but as, uh, it's really a simple question. The, the butter box, the butter, of the one pound butter in the container, was labeled Minnesota Grade A. My question is, anyone know whether or not there is some kind of a grading agency that assigned grades to the, to the butter in those days? Uh, or is it pretty much itself for playing that? <laughs> it's a, that's a really good question. I don't know. I would, um, maybe the Department of Agriculture, you know, tested, I would think. Do you have any comments, Mr. Davis, on that? Do you have any comments <laughs> about that? <laughs> Testing? I don't know if there was a greater in those days, but there definitely was that. There is now, yeah. Okay. Yes? Was there a medal for this world championship? Was there a medal for Paris? Did something come to him? We have, uh, what do you call it? A certificate? It's a display thing with several medals in it. Okay. Yeah. It would be fun to look at that yeah. and see if one of them is from Paris. But he entered many competitions throughout the Midwest when he came to New Sweden. And, and then he won medals at all of them. I didn't list them all because there's too many. But, but, um, so, but I never heard or was able to find out if there was one for Paris. And that's why Julian Olson and I were looking at that that photo of him wearing, the, and we thought surely that must be photo from Paris, but no, you know, he did not go to Paris no. with his butter. <laughs> yeah, I read up on, like you said, how it was traveled and right. with the ice and all that. Uh, they had some ceremony here in Minnesota for him, but that's all I know. Okay, and they probably celebrated at the New Sweden yeah. Creamery at some point. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes, hello. So the butter was shipped Right. Oh, then before it came to Paris, which French port did you say it was? Le Havre. Okay. That's, I'm not maybe saying that right, but it's H-A-V-R-E. Is that right? Okay. Thank you. And then, and then because it was summer, it was June, probably, or late May when they were shipping it. And um, they, I guess we had refrigeration in our trains and then, and they had refrigeration on board the steamer but not in that overnight train to Paris. And, and did you see, we'll go back to this, <clears throat> the pavilion and, and um, Mr. Uh, Alvord in his report, I just love that picture. Look at all those people, those decorated people. You can see how upset they would have been. That, what, new sweet, you know. <clears throat> and these magnificent, Haystacks. People were, you know, the rural areas. There's such beauty. Okay, so do you see those glass? You know, and, and so Major Alvord wrote in his report, which you can read online, that it was very unsatisfactory. He was not happy about it, you know, about how it was treated. But thank goodness, 
um, it worked <laughs> somehow. Other questions? Yes, Winnie. Can you show the cup? Yes, I will show the cup. So, like, um, okay. So, Winnie, yes. Winnie's Renicky, Davis Renick, and Mamie's daughter, yeah. in case you need to know, would like to know. This, this is a tin cup from. Sorry. And you maybe you all have this already, and I'm going to donate it to this facility today. And Arlene had it, my sister, Your sister. Arlene had it. When my parents died, we cleaned the house up, you know, all those little things go. And she ended up with this, and she said, I just got to get rid of some of my stuff. So we met in Hutchison about a month ago, and she said, You take this to the Nicola County Historical Society and read about oh, Karen's yeah, speech. Right. So I had looked it up when you were doing this, and so I made sure I brought this along today. And it was seven, it, it was in an auction. She paid two fifty for it. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, and Bonnie, would you like to Bonnie Bonnie uh, Tustinson brought something to share too. And there you maybe all have things from the New Sweden Creamery. Okay. So this is this says compliments of the New Sweden Creamery, and these are, people have has sent things. You all probably have these in your, not New Sweden necessarily, but something else in your collection like this. And should I say that Bonnie would like to donate this today too? Uh -huh. She would like to donate this today too. <laughs> and anyone else like to donate something? <laughs> yes. Abby. Do you know when they went from uh, doing bulk, people coming in with their class for bulk of butter and when they went to the pollen box? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody else know? Anybody else want to comment? Repeat the question. Would you re repeat Yeah, would you say that again? When? I was wondering when they went to pollen boxes of butter versus the people bringing in a two or three, four pound crock and they would buy both butter. Okay. Does someone have an answer for that? Garfield? I didn't hear the question. Oh, the question was, the question was when they uh, stopped doing bulk butter. Uh, 48, because uh, that's an interesting point in the, <clears throat> the dairy industry, they quit making butter and they went to selling bringing whole milk to the creamery. Because at that particular time, the association of creameries in Nicollet, Brown, and Sibley built a grinding plant in, okay. Wal in uh, Winthrop. Okay. <clears throat> so farmers then uh, delivered whole milk to the creamery, and then they came on the bulk tank and took it up to Winthrop. At that, that same period of time, farmers were putting in bulk tanks. Okay. So they didn't have to monkey with cans. So that was a transitional period of time. And uh, not too many years after that, most of the farms went to grade 8 milk. Sure. Before that, it was all manufacturing and uh, uh, non fat dry milk. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Garfield is here, Harold Rodning is here. You know, they're great historians. Any other questions you might have? There's another interesting thing that took place at this time at the World's Fair in Paris, 1900. There was a German engineer from Germany, of course. He came there with a motor, and the motor had so much compression that it could fire without a spark plug. <clears throat> the engineer's name was Rudolf Diesel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the diesel yeah, engine. Diesel engine. <clears throat> and what is interesting, the fuel was highly refined canola oil. That's 100% <laughs> renewable. It's, uh, it's a plant. Yep. And the big news in recent years is when we started adding diesel oil, or uh, soybean oil, to diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. Well, Rudolf Diesel did that 125 years ago. There we go, there we go. Good, thank you, thank you. Other questions that you may have? 
Anything else? Any other thing that anybody would want to say? Yes. Show that picture of Sam Lundahl and his family. Sure. <clears throat> okay. But just look at that. Just look at that. Isn't that something? How many have gone up? Eiffel Tower. Tower. We were all the way up. I got up just to the first level because it was so windy they didn't take anybody to the <laughs> You'll have to go back. There. That's the that's the photo. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Brad, that should have been your grandpa. Yes. Yeah. And you had a brother to say? Yeah. Yeah. The uh, daughter married. My grandfather married uh, Lindenberg, that Roy T. Lindenberg Pool. Mm -hmm. And and it said that on Anna, your great grandmother, died at her home. But you know. It's such a better world today when we know the first names of people instead of just as at her daughter's home, Mrs. So and so. Anyway, that's just a comment for me personally. But yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there was a hog doll that was a race car driver, well known. But it's not, I don't think it's, I think it might be a nephew of Sam because I was reading through some other material and it talked about how this race car driver came to St. Peter and was shown around by his uncle. So it must have been uh, a nephew of Sam Hogdahl. I haven't checked on that for sure because I, you know, when you, this article that I wrote had to be 1800 words. There was a lot that was left out. But I also want to tell you that when, when I submitted a draft for this just to the editor to say, what do you think about this? He said, keep going. So then I submitted another draft, and he said, this, this may be good for publication, but it has to be peer reviewed. So it was reviewed by others, and they asked questions, and they challenged what I had written. And so I answered all the questions and so forth, and so it was published. So it's not an easy thing. And so I, I'm very pleased that it's factual. <laughs> And they checked everything. They checked all the footnotes. I know this. So, yes? Are you talking about your article <clears throat> last fall? Yes, mm -hmm. last October. The second quick question. So the Eiffel Tower would have been from a previous book? Yes. The Eiffel Tower was from, uh, I think, 1878 or something like that. Thank you. 1889. And the thing was, it was supposed, it was a, such a folly. And it was supposed to be taken down. Nobody. They, there's a big story about that too. I looked that up, um, and there's a whole book written about it, Mr. Eiffel's Tower, um, that I had read. But it was supposed to come down. It was not, you know, people. Were, oh, now what's that ugly thing? <laughs> Winnie. Wasn't there a time when they wanted to take the same, the uh, New Sweden sign off the map, and didn't it get put on because of this famous butter maker? I believe story? that's the story. I remember that story too. Anybody here was part of that? Harold, do you remember that? When the New Sweden sign was coming down? Yeah, a bunch of people, a bunch of people in, in the township who were really upset about that and they, they went around with a petition to get with signers to get it back on the map and it was put back on the map. Mm -hmm. after, I think there was three or four hundred people that signed the yeah. petition. Not only local farmers, but some people from St. Peter, friends of the, of the Creamery even signed it. Right. So after the petition was presented to the governor and to the state, it was put back on the map. Yep. I remember that too. I think Roger Erickson had something to do with broadcasting that on WCCO, right? Yeah. Right. And I think he talked to Paul Bjorkland, who had. My, my father was one of the persons who went around the township to <laughs> yeah. take signatures. Yeah, Clarence Rodney. He was on the board of the creamery at that time. Okay. Other questions that people might have or comments. This is so interesting. Other comments or? Just, yes, Winnie? It is such a beautiful building that it was. Um, why did it have to be taken down? Here's Garfield. Garfield will answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to update where we are today. Some time ago when I was visiting with well, I, the young lady in the 20s. And uh, I was explaining the 
new Sweden Premier in the history. And I thought I had done a pretty good job. And I got done, she says, what's a groomer? What's a groomer? So, yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. And when you think there's, there's if I, am I correct, there's two dairy farmers left in New Sweden. I mean, family dairy farmers in New Sweden and Norseland. So, and it's that way all over, all over. So we have to be patient. And as Ann Almondson told me once when I was said, I was trying to explain Norseland and New Sweden, and she said, they'll never get it. Don't, don't waste your energy. <laughs> Whoops, sorry, sorry. Okay, any other questions? Otherwise, thank you so much for your time and for coming today and for supporting the Nicollet County Historical Society. It's really important. It's a place for research, a place for understanding who we are. And there's a woman uh, many years ago who wrote, museums are the savings bank of our souls as a community. So keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And thank you everyone for coming. And again, thank you for being members. And thank you for showing support today. We appreciate it. And if you've got a few minutes, if you haven't been here in a while, please look around. Uh, our Bottles and Brewers exhibit is here. We've added some new things to the Township exhibit. Um, and if you haven't completed that member survey yet, Kate is back there. And she is waving a survey around. Um, and again, I hope to see you at a future program, maybe film series, maybe at the Cox House on Sunday or at Christmas. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Everyone drive safe. Thanks.